Hey there, this is Derek Murphy of Creativity.com. I wanted to talk about the difference between a main plot, a side plot, and a subplot. This is something I've seen people ask, and I didn't really cover it previously in my writing resources or my book on writing called Bookcraft. Um, I haven't really gone into this distinguishing phase, um, and I recently had the opportunity to go a little deeper in this for an online um, writing event called Escape the Plot Forest. It's going to be at the end of October. Um, so I put up a little blog post on creativity.com where I talk about how to write satisfying fiction. And I've embedded the full presentation slide deck that I'm using, um, 12 slides. But even though, like, even if you can see these slides, it's not totally going to make sense unless you're familiar with my writing resources. So I want to make a quicker video just talking about this one slide because I think it's pretty interesting. So I like to say that a good book is an impossible journey, which means for your protagonist who starts the book, they are not physically, mentally, or morally capable of completing the challenges through the course of the book in a way that's going to get them to change into someone who is big enough or strong enough or wise enough to do the things that they need to do in order to defeat the antagonist or at least finally overcome their limitations or whatever it is. So your main plot, the main story, um, mostly it's the what actually happens, but it's what happens to your protagonist and you want to only have the things that matter to the protagonist. Um, so you may already be asking, well then what about the side plot and the subplot? How do those fit in? When are they important? And we'll get to that in just a minute. But this is really important to home in on because a lot of people have problems with their main plot in that there's too much backstory, too many side plots or subplots. There's too much other stuff going on. Um, so readers are always going to focus on the biggest conflict. So especially if you hook the beginning of your book with a really strong, big conflict, you know, a, a terrorist attack or whatever, um, they're always going to be wondering questions that relate to that biggest conflict. So when you try to spin out into a subplot or a side plot or even a main plot that is not satisfying because nothing is changing or happening, um, it's not going to work very well. Readers will be impatient. So you can slow your main plot down by offering a hard boundary. So sometime during the quest or the adventure or whatever, they have their pressing needs, they have their questions that they can't resolve, but they've already tried to discuss what to do next and they haven't come up with anything. Um, Harry Potter is a really good example because they always know that Voldemort is trying to kill him, but they never, even when Harry like really should take action, he just doesn't because he doesn't know what the next step is or he's busy with other things. Um, they're also always going to focus on the most pressing need. So maybe there's a huge villain who's trying to take over the world, but he's not attacking right now today. Right now today, her best friend has lost their little brother and they have to go out and find them. So a small pressing conflict can interrupt a bigger conflict, but it can't go on too long because after a few chapters, readers will be asking, you know, why aren't they getting back to this major premise, this main big conflict that was already introduced earlier, why are they just forgetting about it? So even if they're not actively working on the quest, they need to be bringing it up from time to time, you know, every couple chapters, like, I wish I could do this, or I hadn't stopped thinking about that big problem, but I just couldn't see a way forward, maybe show that she's trying to do, find some things. Um, so that's an opportunity where you can slow things down, slow things down and introduce a side plot or a subplot, um, but just not for too long. If you have too many chapters where there's no real conflict, where things are not happening, something new needs to happen or change in every chapter, um, then it's a good opportunity to cut that out or add more conflict. So the main plot is what happens to your protagonist, and it will probably focus on interior and exterior conflict, which means the things that are happening that are outside the control, the things that happen to your protagonist, and also the interior um, moods and shifts and emotions that the main character is feeling. Since I mentioned emotions, it's really common in amateur writing to have too much emotions too early on. Um, your emotional 
style needs to have room for the last few scenes or chapters where the really big stuff happens. So if they're already, you know, things are hilarious. Uh, on the one hand, often authors use big emotional terms um, because they have weak scenes because the scenes are not actually very exciting. So they try to make them exciting by having the main characters have very exciting emotional reactions to plot events that are just not exciting. Um, so that's something to be aware of. You want to save a lot of your emotion until much later in the book. You really want to focus hard on what's happening. Your protagonist will probably not be, even if they feel emotions, they won't be having emotional tantrums or outbursts. But they will be thinking about what they want, how do they feel about this, um, and there should be some interior conflict between what they want and what they have to do. Um, they're going to be having to make decisions. So there's this idea of values in conflict for a strong book. So it's not only conflict between the what happens and the action, it's also conflict between your different characters' belief systems, not just what they want to achieve or what, they, what they're actively pursuing, but you know who they are as people, what they believe in, how they um, support themselves or compose themselves. Those are the values that are going to be in conflict. All right, so now let's move over to the side plot. Uh, and these are my definitions, but I did do a little bit of research online and they're not, you know, they're not exactly what other people say, but they're not exactly the opposite either. So these broadly fit in with what other people have said about side plots or subplots um, with a unique spin that might be really useful to you. So a, sub, a side plot is basically the why. It's something that's integral to the main story it's experienced but not chosen. This witnessing influences later decision making or awareness. So basically a really good side plot is something that shows the world worth saving. That's one sort of important part. Um, basically all your side plots are an opportunity to show your characters in a non-stressful environment. So you do want some light fun scenes where your characters have a chance to bond or relax together. Um, and these might seem trivial, but can be very important later if they influence the protagonist's decision, even in the sense of a slide reel, which is where at the end of the book, when they're finally forced to make this big major sacrifice, um, one of the things that can often happen is they sort of have like a, a counting scene where they count up all the, sometimes they say like, after all we've been through to get here, you know, this is what's at stake. Or sometimes they say like, these are all the wonderful people I've met or the places I've been. All of those things are at risk. So if you didn't show all of those things in the main plot, um, you wouldn't have the larger picture responsibility of why this conflict even matters. Um, so you, you want to have scenes where maybe they seem like very low stakes, maybe they seem irrelevant to the main plot, but actually by experiencing those events and witnessing those events, the main character is becoming a different person. They have more to lose. They have more things that they care about. If they didn't have these light, um, you know, slow fun scenes, they wouldn't feel so strongly. They wouldn't have had, this is what I call in book craft as um, the opportunity to make readers fall in love with your characters because they probably won't be falling in love with your characters in those, in those big battle scenes where the stakes are really high. Your characters are just going to react because of who they are. But before that, you need to show your readers who your characters are in low stakes scenes. Um, so these scenes are an opportunity to show the world we're saving. You can introduce some levity or conflict. And even if they don't seem very relevant, this is sort of like a touch point where at the end of the book, at the end of the main plot point, um, your main character can look back at the skipping stones of these side plot scenes, you know, not things that they didn't choose. Maybe they met new people or went to new places trying to figure out somebody's um, quest. So these can feel really accidental, but then once you're at the ending and you have that scene where the protagonist is looking backwards, which is pretty common and very effective, um, these are the scenes you would be looking back at. So it's the culmination of these light 
interesting, magical, whatever um, scenes that didn't really have a high emotional stake for your protagonist at the time, but your protagonist has nice feelings about the characters or the places involved in those scenes, which will direct her willingness to sacrifice herself or sacrifice what she wants um, in order to save everybody else, which is generally how a lot of fiction novels wrap up, where there's a shift from, you know, the personal desires to a larger letting go um, for the, the greater good. So one of the other things I haven't really mentioned is your side plots can be more related to your side characters. It's just an easy way to remember it, side plot, side character. Um, so you may wonder like how much backstory do you need for your side characters and how deep do, should you go? Um, not that deep, like with your side characters, you always sort of want them to be through the filter of your protagonist because that's the main story. So your side characters are there for interesting adventures or side quests um, or conflict because they want different things. So your side characters should all have their own unique, different wants and needs. And then you can try to link these up in a dramatic way later on. So basically the point of a side character's side plot would be to give them greater obstacles or challenges that might be relevant or useful um, in the final battle scene. So they're not really superfluous, they're just supportive. So here's an example from the NaNoWriMo project that I'm working on right now. Um, I basically had my main plot. I know that they have to go to this one compound to try to find allies, um, and I want some stuff to happen there. So I basically had that, but I've introduced a lot of things that happen with the side plot and the side plot, the side characters, um, which will go something like this. So this particular compound where they're trying to recruit allies, um, they're special and unique because they have sort of a gun culture where they have a lot of firearms, but in my fantasy world, nobody can really use guns because once you fire a bullet, the monsters will come and kill you. So you really only have one shot and it's almost never worth it. So in the context of this community, they, they don't revere guns, but they pride themselves on being devastatingly effective with one shot, even when their life is at risk. And they all carry around one bullet so that in case the monsters um, drag them into their cave to feed their young or whatever, the one bullet is not for the monsters, the one bullet is for themselves to take their own life before they suffer needlessly. So that's the background. Um, and in my main plot, what I basically have happen about at the midpoint is one of the main characters is going to die. I'm not completely sure, but I'm pretty sure at about the midpoint, um, one of my main characters is gonna, is gonna die. It's gonna be really sad. And to make that death really dramatic and really traumatic, before you get to the death scene, you have to build up that character and that um, the emotional ties. Um, and you have to give the character a sense of hope. You give this, you see this all the time in movies and TV serials. Um, right before they kill off a character, you have this scene where the character finally has like a happy resolution. You resolve everything, that character feels fulfilled and happy, and then you kill them just when they finally had everything figured out. That's sort of, you know, a way to build the drama. So I already pretty much knew which side character was going to die and how, um, but the side plot elements that I'm building into the world building, two of my side characters are going to, there's already sort of in love, they're gonna sort of get married using this compound's culture with the bullets. Um, they basically exchange bullets or one gives the other one a bullet, which is like, I give you my life, I would die for you kind of thing um, that she's wearing around her neck. And then they travel, they go to other places, there's another big final battle. Um, and what will happen is one of the side characters will use that bullet that she got that symbolizes the, the marriage to save the other one who gave her the bullet by firing one gun and killing a, a vampire. There's vampires in my book. Um, but by doing so, by saving her love and shooting that one bullet, it's like an alarm and all the monsters come and tear her apart. That'll be a much 
more tragic, much more satisfying, um, brutal death because of these side plot issues. So it's not just like one event, it's a running theme that goes through the side character's um, love story that's going to make the death more dramatic and more satisfying ultimately. Mostly it's like, it's gonna hurt more. Um, it's gonna be more emotionally impactful to the protagonist who is friends with these people. Um, she has her own love interest. They're gonna have their own conflicts that are equally as dramatic later on. But, um, but this will definitely impact her in a dramatic way. And so the final thing I'll say on this side, pl side plot issue is um, you can think of it in terms of foils. And the way that this works is that when your protagonist is stuck with a challenge, often it's a moral decision. They have a very difficult moral decision to make. They're not sure what to choose and they're feeling stuck and frustrated about it, that's a great time to have a side plot where your side character is dealing with a sort of similar issue. It's not the same, but in the context of that episode where your protagonist is just distracting themselves and helping a side character with their own issues, they are able to see the answer to their own dilemma. Um, they're able, like maybe it's the advice that they give, maybe it's something that somebody else says about that circumstance or that, um, that scene. So even though it's not direct, like the protagonist is just trying to figure out her own issues, but is distracted by this other stuff, which doesn't seem immediately relevant, but because they're so focused on their own problems, they see some kind of a sign that's applicable to their own problem. So that can work really well um, for when you have a relevant side plot where it's immediately, like your protagonist needed it to go on with their main plot. It was actually necessary for the main plot, even though they didn't know that when they went into it, they're not, you know, this is generally like making decisions based on your protagonist's end goals. Whereas this one is more distractions because your protagonist has no, they don't know what to do next. They don't know where to go next. Um, all they can do is react to what happens. So normally if they were facing their pressing deadlines and they knew what they wanted and they had the clear next step and, and they knew what to do, they wouldn't, they wouldn't agree to a side plot. There'd be no reason for them to be like, sure, I'll help you find your cat or whatever. Um, and they shouldn't because you know, the, goal, the stakes should be pressing enough that they will not willingly be distracted. Um, however, if they've reached an impasse and they don't know how to proceed, that's where you can introduce a very interesting side plot that gives, your, it gives you a chance to fall in love with your side characters, it gives you a chance to show the world worth saving. And um, by remembering this side plot episode later, your character will be able to make a very difficult choice because it it meant something even if they didn't see it right away it was meaningful or impactful to them so to sum up really quickly the main plot is the what the side plot is the why why does this matter why is this relevant what are their motivations um, finally the subplot is the how i like to use what why how just as a kind of easy way to split things up um, and this one's a little more nuanced so it might not be the ideal place for me to introduce or talk about all of these aspects, but I'll try to go through a lot of them. Um, so these are the brooding tensions or lingering questions that get resolved as characters' knowledge or understanding grows. Basically, this is going to be all the questions they have and the answers that are not forthcoming. In order to have suspense and intrigue, it's mostly about information management, which means you have to... First, maybe in your first rough draft, you just have to figure out what happens. Um, the why, the side plot, is often more the first round of revision, where I'm figuring out the motivations. Why did these characters do these things to, you know, to actually complete the main plot's journey? Um, the subplot's going to be the plot holes. So these are the information gaps which need to be 
moved around in the revision phase because you don't want to give away too much too early. And if you actually tell readers exactly what's going on, it won't be interesting. There will be no suspense or intrigue. People read to find out what happens next. So if they can guess what happens next or it's really clear or obvious, then there's not going to be a reason for them to keep reading. Um, the way to create intrigue is to remove information and add questions instead. Although with questions, you can't have them ask precisely the perfect question or guess exactly what the truth is. Um, so with red herrings down here, this is where you hint wrong, you elude, grasp, unresolved questions. Red herrings are like, you know what happens, but you want to keep it from readers. So you can add in some clues that seem to point in a different direction. So you want basically, you want your protagonist to always be asking smart questions, but you want her knowledge to be um, eluded. You, you can't allow her to get the, to guess the, the truth or to get the answers she needs, um, which is tricky because if it's obvious and your character doesn't just guess it, your readers are going to feel like your protagonist is not very smart. So you have to plant red herrings, which is just like given the context of the information that she knows, the best logical guess that she can make is what they are. That's their, maybe they don't know it's true, but that's, you know, their presumption. That's what they're going on. It's enough. It's likely enough to get them to take some steps and forward on their main plot um, and at least, you know, try to go and do something. It gives them a lead to pursue, even if they might be wrong. But you don't want them to actually guess the main thing that's actually going to happen. Um, and you also don't want them to know information too early. So whenever you have really important, crucial information, that's going to be one of your big twists or reveals. You don't want to dump it into your content. It should be at the end of your scene, right before the scene break or the chapter break, um, because it's a thing, it's an event, it's a happening. So that thing, once your protagonist knows that thing that you've been holding back and resisting the entire novel, you kind of have to structure when those pieces of information are going to drop. But that droppage, that, that one new piece of information is a plot point. It's a change. It's a dramatic turn of events. Um, so you don't want to just dump it into your content. That's the thing that, that, that happens. That's a point of the scene. So with subplots, you can think about things that might happen or could matter. Um, so this would be sort of like uh, creating a sense of foreboding or suspense where maybe it's not dangerous now. Maybe you're not saying there's a real threat right now, but you're sort of hinting that bad things might happen later. You're setting little clues. And in the beginning, they won't be very serious. So you want to put them there and then your main character will basically see them and blow it off like, oh, my keys are missing, but I must have left them in my car. Um, so that you've, you've planted the right seed, but you've also minimalized it so it's not a big deal. Because if your character really realized and freaked out about the clue, they wouldn't be distracted by anything else. They'd want to find the answer immediately. If the question is too burning, they won't be put off. Um, they'll just drop everything and search for their keys or whatever. So you want to um, introduce some clues of things that might be important later so that they're, because it's not a twist if, like it's not a surprise or a twist if it just comes out of the blue, if there was no clues, if it's, um, you know, it just magically appears or happens, but it's completely unexpected. Um, that's not a twist. A twist or a surprise is different from what readers assumed. And readers are going to assume what your pr protagonist assumed. So you have to sort of give your readers plausible um, understanding of what's going on so that they can maybe make some guess about what might be the case. And then for a twist to happen, it has to be something that they didn't see coming, but could have been seen. Like once you get the reveal, then those few clues you dropped earlier will make sense. But when they first came up in the text, they didn't just give it all away because otherwise you wouldn't have the surprise of the twist later. So the subplot would basically be like the unknowns. It's the, it's the gap, it's the dark hole that your, your readers will notice, but they will have enough patience, 
as long as you're you know writing good um, they'll have enough patience and they'll trust you to fill in the hole later so you can dig the hole and that's basically your subplot you can dig the hole by resisting knowledge by you know you can make notes in your first draft but then you want to take them all out your backstory your history a lot of your big world building you may wonder where that needs to go in um, it absolutely should not go in the first 25 percent of the book it should not go in the first chapter which is where most authors put it um, it needs to come in later your protagonist if she is used to the scene and the setting and the world building, she's not going to spontaneously comment on the way that the world works. Um, you need to introduce that differently. Your protagonist is going to notice what's out of place. If they're looking around their room or their town or whatever, they're going to notice what's different from usual. And as long as you use that rule, that can be pretty effective as a way of scene building because she won't just be walking through town, noticing everything, commenting on everything in her head. Um, but if you say, you know, there was a new dent in the lamp post and she guessed that that meant that her neighbor was out driving drunk again or whatever, then you can introduce a lot of, you know, the world building, the characterization, a lot of stuff. But with description, you focus on what's different, what's different and unexpected um, in the scene, not just how and where everything is. So I'll wrap this up with talking more about backstory because it is really important. Most people have a pretty pretty good idea of what their main character's backstory is, what their protagonist's backstory is. Um, and a lot of authors feel like they need to share it all in the first chapter so that we understand the character and the character's motivation. But you really don't. You want to start in the ordinary world where something new happens. Your main character should already be in the action. She should already be going somewhere, doing something, probably... Um, something really important in my 24 chapter outline um, the first chapter is like a very big day so it's it's something that represents your main character's status quo agenda that they've been striving after for a long time and what's probably going to have to happen in the first chapter is they're not going to get what they have wanted for a long time which opens up this um, gap of possibility where for the first time they're able to think about other things um, but anyway you're not going to dive into the backstory because no matter how traumatic the backstory, your main character is not sitting around thinking about the backstory. They're not just drinking beer, thinking about what happened to them 20 years ago. That's almost never the case. And even if it is, it's really boring writing. That's not the way to start a book. Um, instead, your backstory should be really dramatic and painful, but they're not going to dwell on their traumatic past until they are faced with traumatic episodes. And your traumatic episodes shouldn't come until you know, the second half or the final, like one fourth of your book, the, the, your, the final climatic scenes are going to be so dramatic, they force an emotional shift. They force your character to face things they have never faced since being in similarly traumatic experiences. And probably what they've done is buried their trauma. So they actively avoid it for the entire book. It's only in the face of a final battle or challenge which is so difficult that they cannot process it. They are not able, um, the person that they are, the person that they've been through the entire book is not able to succeed or defeat that antagonist or that scene or that obstacle. Um, that's when it's going to feel very threatening for them because it's going to threaten their identity that they protect. So that's the place where finally you will do a full backstory reveal to figure out why is this obstacle impossible for this character? Why specifically is this obstacle the thing that this character resists doing? Um, and it can be something really strong. A lot of times in, in Netflix or movies, you have a foil example where at the beginning, um, the character can't open the attic because it reminds her of her son's death. At the end, she opens the attic. That's the symbolic resolution that the character has made emotional change through the course of the no of the novel um, by offering like a simple challenge. So in one, in another one that I'm thinking of, um, he's afraid of heights, so he goes to camp. And at the beginning of the book, to sympathize the, the protagonist, he basically, he's halfway up the climbing wall at camp, but he can't finish the climbing wall. Everybody makes fun of him. At the end of the book, um, and this particular example 
this actually has sort of two backstories. So that's like the the base level normal fear, which is a fear of heights. So at the end of the book, he climbs this massive communication tower to send out a signal. So it's a really visual, really obvious. Um, we saw what happened at the beginning, and then we see that he's braver than he was at the beginning of the book because he's able to do this obstacle that previously had thwarted his efforts. Um, but there was another one in the same example where um, he also had a really deep fear of fire because he lost his parents in a fire and he wasn't brave enough. He had to be like rescued. So at the very end, after he's climbed the tower, he also has to um, escape through a burning building. And that's the point where you finally get the flashback. It's in that last cut scene, basically in the middle of the final battle scene, you know, you the the point of the final battle is they they go into it, maybe having an idea of what they're up against, but they are always surprised by the protect by the antagonist forces. There's always something they didn't expect. Um, at the midpoint of the final battle, there's always a point where the hero is going to lose. The protagonist is going to lose this battle, and they have to then find inner strength, or you know, there's some other unforeseen thing. They were not able to beat this quest but because of the pressure and because of the awareness of the potential for failure in the middle of the final battle scene that's where they finally dig into a place that they've never reached for before which might be related to their deepest childhood trauma where they finally realize something there's an internal emotional shift which is often um, a matter of you know, it's almost like a little time out where they reflect over their childhood. It could be, like I mentioned, the World War Saving slide reel where they look back over everybody who's counting on them and how far they've come and everything they've lost and given up to get this point. And they basically realize that they cannot fail. They cannot go back. Um, they must go forward even if it destroys them, which it should because it's an impossible challenge. Um, Anyway, that's where the backstory belongs, where the full, deep, detailed backstory belongs. It's in the middle of the final battle scene. Um, it does not belong in the first chapter. Uh, but all of this stuff, like the subplot, would be, like I mentioned, it's you're digging holes. You might have little references to the backstory where you understand that something traumatic happened in the background, but you don't get the full picture. You're just digging the hole. So through the course of the book, you're digging a hole of subplot which is you know how does this all fit together why does it i don't want to say why and how and whatever but um basically how is this going to end rather than why is this happening or what is happening how is this going to end um you're introducing tensions and questions but you resist resolution until the end of the book if it's a piece of information that has an emotional impact then it, become, it comes before the final battle or the final culmination because it has, to have, it has to have an impact. It has to be a plot point. It has to come in the middle of a scene break or at the end of a, a chapter break where basically, you know, they are, they have, the other thing I, I don't think I've mentioned earlier is before you have a reveal and reveal a crucial piece of information, you have to have raised a question earlier. So earlier in the book, my protagonist will be asking questions. They know that they need this answer. They know they have this knowledge gap, but it won't come up through their efforts. It'll come up sometime later. Later when it finally happens, it's an event. They recognize it as an important piece of information because they knew they were looking for it. Um, anyway, so when that happens, when it impacts the, the main plot or the character has a strong emotional reaction, then you wanna see it in the scene before the final battle um, because after the final battle there's probably going to be like an epilogue scene where you're basically just wrapping up loose ends filling in the plot holes so when you're digging this big hole of subplot um, and you're forcing your readers to ask how is this going to end some of those big important reveals need to come before the ending a lot of them if it's just information like it's just there's a question, but there's no emotional stakes. There's not, there's not huge, big stakes. It's just kind of like an interesting piece of intrigue. Why, 
why did this happen? Where did they get the thing? How did they get from A to B or whatever? Um, they might be things your readers wonder, but they're not really big, impactful events. So these things you can wrap up at the end in an epilogue where one of your characters is sort of just, you know, now they can finally sit around the table and talk it through because all the big dramatic stuff has already happened. Um, you can kind of just wrap up loose ends by filling in the things. So what you want to do with subplot is figure out what the big questions your characters will be asking at every stage of the book, figure out what the answers are. This is the way to find your plot holes. And this is also something that often doesn't happen until late revision stages when you're reading through your rough draft. But you want to be asking, you know, why did your characters do these things? Or what, what were your characters trying to figure out? Um, and you can even work backwards, where if you have a piece of information that you want to turn into a surprise or a reveal, you can just make sure you take out all the references or the mentions of it. Um, and that's a really easy way to, to add intrigue. Instead of just dumping backstory in the first chapter and then they just know everything, you can randomly choose a critical piece of information and withhold it from readers to turn it into brooding tensions or intrigue. So you can start with the piece of information that's going to be the reveal. You also want um, one reveal per scene or per chapter. You don't really want a scene where all the reveals just, you know, come one after another. It's too difficult to scale the emotional response. Um, so you really want one surprising twist or piece of information. Um, you can have lots of information that's not emotionally gripping, but if it's something important that's been resisting them, it's sort of like snapping a rubber band. They've been You've been pulling it back and resisting it, so when they get that snap, it's really going to hit them because they, they feel it. They know that they've been looking for it. But you can have your list of questions. You can have your list of answers um, in your notes or whatever, and then you can just look to structure it in a way where you're not giving away all the information, you're building the intrigue by resisting knowledge. Um, because like I said, readers read to find out what happens next or how is this going to end. You don't want to give away too much too early. Um, so this subplot is the stuff that your readers don't know and your protagonists don't know. And probably, even though it might be there on the page, you hint at it, but it's not too obvious. So your readers might feel that like they've seen some what I call phenomenon. They've seen phenomenon, but they don't know what it means yet. There's some interesting weirdness. Um, that's something I didn't mention here, but you basically want to introduce lots of weirdness where something weird happens. Your protagonist doesn't know what it means. Your readers don't know what it means, but it's weirdness that's unresolved. That's great suspense and intrigue. Just don't tell them how the magic trick works until much later when slowly you can be revealing one thing, but then you have to make more weirdness happen. You have to make more weirdness or unexplainable events that force your protagonist to ask new questions. So there's always some suspense and intrigue, um, and there's always knowledge that resists understanding. Anyway, I hope that this helps. Let me know in the comments if you like my division between main plot, side plot, and subplot. Um, I do have these slides on creativity.com. Subscribe if you haven't already. Like, see you later, bye-bye.